I'm very honored to be, to be the inaugural speaker. Uh, actually, this is not some part of the talk, but it was when uh, people were talking a bit about uh, their ancestors drinking a lot of rum. It did remind me of a story I like to tell my students, which I'm sure all of you know, you have a deep abiding knowledge of the American Revolution. That before the Stamp Act, there was the Sugar Act. Um, and the, why do they want so much sugar and molasses? Because that gets distilled into rum. Um, and you all know with the, um, later on with the, uh, the Tea Act, they were very, very good at not drinking tea. You may not know that the Sugar Act, which was passed in 1764, was actually the tax they paid. And they continued to pay it all the way up to 1774. It brought in that targeted revenue every single year. And people have always been perplexed, why are they able to boycott the tea? Why are they able to boycott the tea, but not the rum? And if you know anything about the late 18th century, you'll actually will know the answer, which is that men drink tea. I mean, men drink rum, women drink tea. And so I've always wondered how that went, when the men went home and said, honey, you've got to stop drinking the tea, my liberties are in danger. And when they did, they said, I'm going to toast you in a nice glass of rum. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, uh, that's, that's the answer. So yes, rum is very important. Um, but anyway, um, what I want to do uh, next night is, is talk about uh, George Washington a bit and sort of his status and attitudes towards him. And, uh, and talk about what I do think is an ordeal. Uh, his last, I think, the last 10 years of his career were quite an ordeal. And the way to uh, get into this is to start with three uh, vignettes, three episodes from uh, the prominent period of his career. And the first one uh, is from 1783. The, uh, just as the news of the Peace of Paris had come and the American Revolution was officially over, and in uh, the spring, no, in the, in the, in the um, early summer of 1783, uh, and news reached the palace uh, at Whitehall in London that George uh, Washington had voluntarily resigned his commission <coughs> in the army and gone back to private life in Mount Vernon. And the king, George III, heard of this. And he didn't believe it. And he said, I don't believe that anyone with that kind of power and that kind of authority and that kind of military grandeur would ever voluntarily give it up. I know none of my generals. I wouldn't trust any of them to do that if they ever had that equivalent power. But if it's really true that he did that, said George III, then George Washington is the greatest man who ever lived. Um, there's just no question. Someone who would do that, I, I tip my hat to him. Well, he had that. Uh, and the second uh, story uh, is from a few years later uh, at the Constitutional Convention, uh, in late May, the first week. Um, and Governor Morris uh, approached Alexander Hamilton at the convention. And he said, I, I notice Colonel Hamilton. They do. It's not just 10 years after the war. For the rest of their lives, it's their military title that they insist upon being called by. But Colonel Hamilton, I understand, I, I want, I'm, I'm seeing that, that none of you uh, actually go up and, and, and talk in any kind of informal way to General Washington. You, you never invite him to the, to, the, to, to the taverns afterwards. He's never involved with us in anything. He's only, you're always so formal with him. But why is that? And Morris asked this question because he was one of the few people, he'd been in Paris during most of the revolution negotiating with the French, was one of the few people who'd never met Washington before. And Hamilton sort of looked at him and he said, well, I mean, if you're really willing to go up to the general and treat it informally. I mean, if, you, if you're really willing to do that, uh, I'd love to see you do it. And if you do it, I'll, I'll stand you and 20 of your closest friends to dinner at the best tavern in the city, uh, City Tavern, Philadelphia. And Morris said, well, sure, okay, I'll do it. And he walked up to Washington and he says, well, hello, George, how are you? And Washington sort of froze him with this stare. He kind of <coughs> spacked away, trembling, and came back to the head and said, oh my god, I'll never do that again. Uh, and so and these, these two stories, I like them because I think they really illustrate the degree to which, during his own lifetime, Washington was, was, was viewed as this incredible, almost, almost mythic figure. Um, but the third story, uh, which comes from a few years after that, 1794, uh, is, is, is from an open letter that Thomas Paine wrote to Washington and had published in a Philadelphia newspaper, the Philadelphia Roar, which at the time was probably the most prominent, widely circulated newspaper in the country. Uh, Thomas Paine, very famous, you know, if we go by his probably total, total um, editions of publications, the most prominent writer in, uh, coming out of the Revolution of Europe. And in this open letter, Paine um, said to Washington, addressed it to him, said, there are really only two questions about you, sir. Uh, are you an apostate or an impostor? Have you simply violated every principle you once had, or did you ever hold any principles worth holding at all? Um, and the fact is that by 1794, Paine was not alone in thinking this. That by 1794, a growing number of Americans, a surprising number of Americans, in fact, had begun to believe that Washington was, in fact, part of an interested, dangerous cabal, actively seeking to overthrow Republican institutions and Republican government, and possibly even, in stealthy way, return and restore a degree of British authority and power. 
Not so, uh, but a lot of people did believe it, and certainly they were, even the things that he was doing were considered very dubious by many of his fellow Americans. So I want us to sort of try and look at tonight how we get there. How do we get from the first two stories to the third story? What does that suggest? And what I'm going to suggest is that it doesn't say so much about Washington as it does about the drift of, the, of, the, of American post-revolutionary culture and society and the kinds of issues that were developing, which were, in fact, arranging themselves to the point where people like George Washington didn't have as much of a place as they thought they would have had in the kind of society the revolution was producing. And I want to talk about why that would be and what some of the implications are. So the first way to try and understand how we move from the mid-1780s to the 90s in this very different view of Washington is to step back for a bit and just think about how improbable the American Revolution was. I mean, it really was, as a recent historian has called it, a leap in the dark. This was a very unlikely and improbable thing. It's very unlikely at the, at the end of the 18th century, whatever you think your problem is, that you would conclude the solution is a republic. This is not a very, this is not a normal, sensible thing to conclude. This is a very radical and subversive thing to conclude. Uh, and it's, not, it's radical and subversive not because it had never been tried before. It was radical and subversive because, in fact, it had been tried many, many times before. And the people who were trying it now in 1776 knew all about the previous efforts. In fact, you can probably think about it, you realize actually republics pop up a lot in the history of, of, of the West. Uh, all the way back to antiquity, there are stories of Republican experiments. Greece, Rome, uh, much more recently, in the mid-17th century, England had tried a Republican experiment for 12 years. Probably more, maybe they had Charles I. They don't bring Charles II back until 12 years later, in between their republic. In fact, the United States in 1776 wasn't even the only Republican experiment. The Dutch had been a republic for a long time. And yet, the Dutch Republic was really clearly uh, in its, in its pa well past its glory. Because in 1776, the people who were deciding to try a Republican experiment knew something about the history of republics. The one thing they knew, and they could see these, this theme again and again and again and again, was that Republican experiments always failed. Right? The Greek city-states had been overrun. Rome had degenerated from a republic into, a, into, a, into, a, into an imperial, imperial tyranny. England obviously had given up on its Republican experiment. They do restore the Stuarts back in 1660. And the Dutch Republic had a nice run, but nobody was going to argue by 1776 that it wasn't in deep, deep decay. In fact, it would end in the early 19th century and be over, overtaken by Napoleon. Uh, Republican experiments didn't seem like a very sensible idea. Uh, and there was a reason for this. And all you needed to do was be well steeped in classical knowledge to understand why republics didn't work very well. And it just turned out that the men who were declaring independence in 1776 were very well steeped in classical learning and classical knowledge. This was, in many ways, one of the ways you demonstrated that you were a proper general. So if you're steeped in classical knowledge, what do you know about republics? Well, you've read through Aristotle, and you know that all human societies tend to divide into one, few, and many. And the one, the few, and the many all have real virtues, but they also have profound vices. The one, uh, the great souled figure, possibly someone like a George Washington, the one, or, or a king, the one provides great wisdom and, and authority, power, but if left to his own devices, can become a, a dangerous despot. And the few certainly provide wisdom. They're usually the best educated, the most talented, the most capable men in a human society. But if they're not held in check, if they're, not, if they're left to their own devices, they'll become an oligarchy ruling in their own interests. And the many, Aristotle said, are vital to any good power. They have a deep concern for liberty, zealous concern for liberty. But if left to their own devices, if not guided properly in check, they will become anarchic. Uh, they'll mishandle and misuse their liberty, and very quickly their liberty will degenerate into license and licentiousness. Now, how do you guard against this? Well, what Aristotle said is you try to bring together the best of the one few and many, and by doing so, by bringing together their best attributes, they can cancel out their worst attributes. So if one few and many are somehow brought together in a proper polity, a proper politics, you can have the wisdom, you can have the strength of the one, the wisdom of the few, the liberty of the many, and they can all prevent each other from degenerating into their vices. Well, that sounds great. Problem was, as far as the founders were concerned, for all of, you know, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years, no one had ever done it. But here's why the American Revolution is the leap in the dark that it is. When the Americans decided to declare independence in 1776, they were actually declaring independence from the society that most educated people believe had actually finally figured out how to balance one of you. Britain was seen by 1776 in most people's eyes as a unique form of monarchy. 
a limited constitutional monarchy that brought together the king, the House of Lords, the House of Commons, that gave considerable power to the House of Commons, the power to control money, the power to tax. The king couldn't pass laws without the acceptance of the House of Commons. In many ways, people attributed Britain's staggering rise to wealth and power in the 18th century to the fact that it was the only society that had ever figured out how to govern as Aristotle all the way back in antiquity had said you should. So that's what the Americans were, in fact, rejecting. What they concluded was, no, that's wrong. Even, and this is what Tom Paine's Common Sense is all about, he says, it turns out, and we don't need to get into the money difficulties, I can certainly talk more about them, but I don't want to go into too much detail. But most Americans were confident by 1776 that Britain had simply tricked them, that they simply surrounded their monarchy with window dressing, that in fact it truly was still behaving as tyrannically as monarchy always would inevitably do, and the only way to really live on the tyranny of the one was to no longer have the one. This was the only solution to the problem. The only way to make sure that the one and the few didn't become tyrannical was to not have the one and the few anymore. Only the many. But, and this is why it's such a leap in the dark, it didn't mean that they still didn't understand the learning of, of the classics. Just because you're getting rid of one and few, you have to do that, doesn't mean that it's not true that the many do tend to misuse and abuse their liberty. They do tend to disintegrate into licentiousness. Everybody in the 18th century believes that. So in many ways, in declaring independence, they were choosing between a very a terrible choice and a dangerous choice. The terrible choice is to continue to live with the one in the view. That will produce terror, no matter what. The dangerous choice, the only option left, is to live with just the many. Because the many alone will degenerate into anarchy and licentiousness at some point. So how do you how can you prevent this from happening? How can you escape the failure that all past republics have gone through? And here's where we bring Washington back in. In many ways, the only reason why many of the founders that we've all heard of could actually bring themselves to take that leap in the dark, to jump into the terrible, messy world of Republican theory and Republican experiments, was because they didn't, in their minds, fully leave behind the world of the one in the few. And you can see this in their writings. You can see them struggling to figure out how can we bring some of the ideas of the one in the few into the republic that we're hoping to be. And the bridge that they come up with, and this is a term that many of them use, Washington uses it, Jefferson uses it, Hamilton uses it, they all use it, is the concept of natural aristocracy. It's a term that uses again and again and again. So what this republic needs in order to work is to be guided by a natural aristocracy. Not hereditary aristocracy, which is just a terrible, privileged, gross fiction that they have in Europe. A natural aristocracy. And what exactly is a natural aristocracy? Well, a natural aristocracy, Washington said, you can spot natural aristocrats pretty easily. Pretty easily. Natural aristocrats are men who choose to devote themselves to the public service and the public good of the republic. Okay. Well, who can do that? Well, in the 18th century, there's a lot of commonsensical requirements to being able to devote yourself to public service. One is you need enough time to do it. Right? You can't be continually concerned about your own survival and your own family's survival. If you're a small farmer on a small plot of land, understandably you have to devote yourself to your planting, you have to devote yourself to your harvesting, you have to devote yourself to maintaining your small farm. You're not going to have the time you require to leave your land behind and deliberate and govern for months and months on end in some distant place. So one of the characteristics of a natural aristocrat is wealth, great wealth the leisure time to be able to take on the burdens of governance. But in many ways, in the 18th century, people like Jefferson and Washington said, wealth is not an end in itself. You don't measure a natural aristocrat by his wealth. You measure him by what he chooses to do with the time his wealth gives him. And if a natural aristocrat chooses to use the time his wealth has given him to devote himself to public service, to devote himself to public good, to develop the knowledge, to understand the public good, and what's that knowledge? Well, you have to know about the failures of past republics, for one thing. And of course, this is before Penguin Classics, so that means you have to read Greek and Latin and have a deep knowledge of the past. If you devote yourself to acquiring these skills and put them to the service of the republic, then that's a good indication that you are a natural aristocrat. And you probably, the republic's needs will probably be safe in your hands. But of course, though, this is a republic. These aren't hereditary aristocrats. How are they going to get positions of authority and power? Well, they're going to have to be voted in. This has to be voluntary. Citizens are going to have to be able to recognize the natural aristocrats among them 
acknowledge their Republican superiority, their better capacity to govern, and choose to place them in positions of authority, and then choose to follow their wise guidance. Which is, if you think about it, a kind of utopian thing to expect. Are most people really going to make those kinds of distinctions? But that concept is essential for them to leap into the dark and believe that this republic can succeed where others have failed. Um, now, there's another problem though, with this idea, which is how do you justify the leap in the dark? How do you say we no longer will be obedient to the British monarchy? A British monarchy they've been obedient to all their lives and had really never, never hadn't been born expecting to not be obedient. How do you justify sedition? How do you justify refusing to provide your obedience to your king, to your liege lord? Well, the only way to do it is to, as Payne said, say, well, kings are kings are not, there are no such things as kings. In fact, these organic, natural distinctions that make some people monarchs and other subjects of monarchs are simply a fiction by man. It's not in nature. God didn't do that. Payne says famously, he said, God created man and woman. He didn't create lord and servant. Uh, there are no such things here. Uh, as differences between common and gentle, between between noble and common. Those, those, those are all fictions. And you can't really justify declaring independence unless you fundamentally reject this notion that some people are physically, all the way to their essences, made differently from other people. But if you think about it, the only way to do that is to accept a pretty radical and universalist language that insists upon an innate human equality. The only way to get rid of a king is to argue that there are no kings. But the only, if you do that, how do you continually insist upon this concept of natural aristocracy? It's harder to make the case that there are different qualities among people that are truly discernible, that should be correspond to political power, if you have rejected the notion that there are fundamental distinctions to be made between people and all. So, <laughs> let me... Um, recap what I've said so far. In many ways, this is the fundamental problem. This is the fundamental problem that they face. In order to have a revolution, in order to declare independence from the king, they have to reject the idea that there are hierarchies and gradations among people. If there are no hierarchies and gradations among people, then you don't have to listen to the king anymore. And that he's declaring you a tyrant, uh, declaring you a despot, declaring you a seditious, what does it matter? He doesn't, he's got all allegiance. But if there are no hierarchies and gradations among people, then how exactly do you talk about natural aristocracy? At the same time, natural aristocracy is essential for people like Washington to think that a republic should, can work. Without it, they don't understand how it can work. So in many ways, the very language that can get them to declare independence, and they can get them to a position where they say, now we can be governed by the best possible people, that same language calls into question whether you can even declare that there are best possible. And that's a fundamental problem. And it's compounded by the actual way the revolution worked. Because in many ways what the revolution becomes is an entire people needing to engage in intense labor, intense activity, and do things they've never done before. I'll just give you one example. New York is a good example. New York City, as you all know, is very quickly occupied by the British. And once it's occupied, normal government in New York ceases to exist. So how does a revolution continue for the next six years without central authority? People are left to their own devices. And what they largely do in their own devices is create their independent city-states, the independent city-state of Poughkeepsie, the independent city-state of Utica. And in these independent towns, which are left to their own devices to manage the revolution in their own local areas for years and years, they form revolutionary committees, they pass laws, they print their own money, they declare wage and price controls, in a word, they govern. And they really get used to governing, and they really start to like to govern. And they develop an intense sense of ownership of the revolution, a belief that their labor, their actions, are what have driven this movement forward. Those, that kind of atmosphere means that there's lots and lots of people who are not necessarily predisposed to accept the idea of natural aristocracy. You throw in the radical universalist language, all men created independence, equality. Those are big and slippery words, right? By slippery, I mean they slide around a lot. And they, and they come to be acquired by lots of different people. And those people are probably going to define those words based on their own consciousness and their own situation. And a small farmer in upstate New York who's printing money and governing and passing laws and declaring that the revolution is, is probably going to define independence and equality differently than Colonel Hamilton. And you go even further, and his wife is probably going to define it differently than he does. 
and a slave is going to probably define it differently than either of them, right? Lots and lots of different kinds of definitions of these big slippery words can come into play, and people like Washington have no choice but to place those words right at the heart of the culture to justify their declaration of independence in the first place. In other words, very, very quickly, there are a lot of unintended consequences of declaring independence, and the society that emerges from it is much more complex and messy than anyone expected it to be at the beginning. Now, I think we're getting closer to the kind of atmosphere that could cause Tom Hay to write the letter he did. But to, to sum it up, um, and to sort of place Washington struggling in what becomes a very radical climate in the late 18th century, I want to start talking about the immediate context of that letter. Now, Payne wrote it in 94. And he wrote it because Washington had become very uncomfortable with a growing number of Americans who were very excited about the French Revolution, which had started in 89, and it turned very radical in 92 with the beheading of the king. <coughs> and people like Washington had become convinced that you could see in the French Revolution that classical model of how republics failed. Here was a mob of indiscreet crazies who were using, misusing liberty and leading to license. But of course, in the kind of world the American Revolution produced, George Washington doesn't get to define what people think about the French Revolution. And there were plenty of people in America who disagreed with him. And he saw the French Revolution as an example of the worst kind of monarchy being overthrown by a republic. A new republic emerging. And you know, my God, if it could happen in France, it could happen anywhere. The whole world could become a republic in the world soon. And how can we as Americans not commit to supporting that? And what it developed was all sorts of little organizations called Democratic Republican Societies emerging in Newark, in Trenton, in Philadelphia, in New York City, all the way down to Charleston, South Carolina, emerging to endorse and support the French Revolution. And when Washington became clear it was opposed to the French Revolution, turning their attention to him and beginning to question, why is this man not supporting our sister republic who assisted us during our revolution? And in fact, beginning to move closer to an alliance with Britain, which has declared war on this new French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Why is that happening? Now, as this criticism developed and found its way into newspapers and more and more organizations began to focus their attention on Washington, Washington was determined to try to explain to them why what they were doing was so wrong, why they were behaving so badly. And he thought to himself, how can I convey to these ordinary, ordinary folk in these democratic republican societies that they're misbehaving, that they're not behaving like proper citizens, that they're not trusting true natural aristocrats to guide them better. And he thought about how he could convey to them in the most damning language possible that democratic republican societies were simply wrong. And he finally came up with what he considered to be the final sort of coup de grace, the final damning statement. And he wrote and published that the democratic republican societies were wrong because they were, quote, self-created societies. Self-created societies. Now you're all thinking, is that it? Doesn't he have any more? I mean, as I said at the meeting, and so some of you know the punchline, after all, you are members of a self-created society, right? The entire American culture is self-created societies. Why is this such a damning indictment? If you think about it, though, the idea of the self-created society fundamentally violates the concept of natural aristocracy. What Washington is saying there is he's saying, you people have not been by large public acclamation called forward to declare your views on public affairs. Nobody wants to hear from you. Therefore, you create your own society and thrust yourselves forward. The proper person to make decisions about what our policy is towards France or anything else is a person who, by universal acclamation, has been acknowledged to be a natural aristocrat. If you have to self-create to get your voice out, by definition, you're an illegitimate voice and you shouldn't be speaking. Of course, the Democratic Republican Society is operating in a completely different world. Don't even see that this is a criticism. And very, very quickly, they, in fact, turn it around and adopt the phrase. They start, and they start in their, in their proclamation saying, the self-created society of Newark believes. The self-created society of, to them, that's what the revolution is all about. Self-creating and then acting upon your, your, your ideas. That's the context in which people can begin to think that George Washington just doesn't seem to be the kind of Republican and revolutionary figure that they need to, or to lead them into what has become a much, much more democratized culture. And what it means is that for a very long time after his death, and I, and now I should say I am now summing up, uh, in a very, for a very, very long time after his death, Washington remained a deeply controversial figure. And the way to see this is to see just how difficult it was to get a monument for him. Now, as soon as he died, they obviously had already named a city after him, though some people would come to regret that. 
there was an effort by his followers to get some kind of majestic monument laid in the new capital city, in Washington City. Um, the first effort was, was first proposed in 1800, and it went nowhere. At this point, his opponents had won, his party had been defeated, uh, people like Tom, you know, not Tom Payne himself, but people who really were in that Payne tradition were much more influential. The last thing they're going to do is lay a monument to George Washington. Um, they quickly try to get an 1801, it goes nowhere. <coughs> they drop it, his supporters, until 1810. No interest in 1810 in laying a monument for Washington. It's voted down. Funds are refused in Congress. We won't do what they say. 1812, they try again. Ah, here's an opportunity. A second war with Great Britain. Everybody's talking about the second war of American independence. And no, not going to do it in 1812. 1816, okay, we've won the war. Uh, people are really interested in things military again. This is reminding us all of our, our great uh, August Revolution. No, they don't. They won't vote. They won't vote the money. 1819, well, okay, there's a big depression in 1819, so maybe they weren't going to do that. 1824, fails again. Uh, 1832, Henry Clay gets interested in maybe doing it, but no, there's clearly still no sentiment in 1832. Famously, James Madison, one of the few surviving founding fathers, remains silent on the issue, doesn't give his endorsement, that helps to kill it. Uh, even in 1832, there's still too much memory of George Washington and too many people who don't want to honor him. Um, finally, in 1848, when everybody who knew him was dead, and already by 1848, hazy mythology is beginning to emerge about that period. They, enough, uh, enough money is raised to lay a cornerstone for a monument. Uh, and then in 1876, and we're now talking about Washington is pure myth at this point. Nobody remembers Washington. 1876, of course, it's more about really bringing the nation back together, papering over the cracks of a deeply divided uh, union that has just recently ended Reconstruction. In 1876, for the first time, enough funds are finally voted to lay a monument to George Washington, which is finally completed in 1885, when he securely passed from history to life. Now, in many ways, by 1885, Washington has become the father of his country. Washington has become the universally beloved, completely uncontroversial figure that, in fact, he never actually was. Uh, and very quickly, his own life had stopped becoming. And what I want to suggest is that that's okay that that happened. Um, one of my favorite historians of nationals is a man named Ernst Gellner. He has a brilliant line where he says, getting their history wrong is part of being a nation. That's what nations do. They get their history wrong. Uh, it's okay to do that. And, and not all myths are the same. The myth of George Washington who never told a lie, who was universally beloved, who always did things that were uncontroversial and for the, and for the good of all people, that's, that's one myth. Another myth is, say, for example, the Nazis' uh, Superman. That's another myth. These are different kinds of myths. And, and myths speak to the kinds of societies that we are, right? It's, it's interesting that our society wants to provide myths about truth-telling, wants to provide myths about military men who give up their military power and subordinate themselves to civilian authorities. That suggests something about our society. It's interesting you can judge Nazi Germany by the myths it tells, right? These are very different kinds of myths. Uh, so myth-making is what nations do. Myth-making is something that all nations do. The kinds of myths they tell, obviously, are but what I would also suggest is the truth similarly too. And as we tell the myths that we tell, that doesn't mean we should be afraid of the truth. We should know about Washington, the man who never told a lie. We should know, know about Mount Washington, who everybody felt deserved a monument. We should also know about the Washington who Tom Paine denounced to a great many people's pleasure when he did it. And if we know all of those things, we'll probably be okay. We might not always be okay, but we'll probably be okay.